Good morning, everybody, and welcome along to this edition of Lear Confidential on LearMedia.tv. And our usual email is, if you want to make a comment on the show or anything, it's info at LearMedia.tv. Now, I'm absolutely delighted to have in studio this morning, remotely speaking, let's be correct about this, Mr. Niall O'Callaghan, and he's the CEO of LEDP. We'll get to all of that in a minute. Welcome, Niall. Uh, good morning, Pat. Thanks for the invite. No problem at all, Niall. And indeed, um, you're from it. You grew up in Adair, Niall, did you? I did. I did indeed. Yeah. Um, born and bred in Adair. Uh, both my parents are are from Limerick City, um, Gary Owen and Kerry's Road, actually. So, um, so but, you're, uh, a pure, you're a pure, pure bred Limerick man. <laughs> I am, I am. Although I, 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 I mean, I'm fond of a bit of a ge- genealogy, and I can tell you it's a fairly checkered. Uh, would you go beyond the first generation? It gets fairly checkered, interestingly enough, you know. But yeah, yeah. Um, but born and bred in Adair, I'm living in Croke at the moment with, with my wife and my kids, so uh, I didn't move too far away. Just down the road, as they say, for, for people who know the job. Really. You can look it up, guys. We'll have to give you something to our viewers to do, but growing up, now, what was it like for you? Were you okay growing up, and what kind of what interested you then when you kind of thought about the world, what you wanted to do, you know? I mean, what yeah. I need to say by that is you were into athletics, were you? I was, yeah, yeah. Uh, my, my dad was, was, uh, was um, he got a scholarship to the States. He went to CBS in Limerick. And um, so the influence from, from athletics came from, from my father, we'll say. Um, so he went, to the, he went to college in the States running and he represented Ireland a few times. What was um, Pat. Pat O'Callaghan. Yeah, yeah. He follows a long line of uh, Olympians, the Pat O'Callaghan just down from Cantor, the famous. That's family. right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No yeah. relation, unfortunately. No relation. But um, <laughs> but so, so the the love of athletics, I suppose, came from there. Now I like I I played uh, soccer and GA growing up, and um, I, my athletics career wasn't overly checkered in my youth, but I I, I uh, yeah I did okay at it, but. Um, so, so that's where that influence came from. But I suppose growing up, um, like any other uh, child in Limerick, I suppose you know you follow sport, you've you've, you've plenty of different interests. I, I suppose I ne- I didn't really know what I wanted to be when I grew up, if that makes sense. You know, I, I never had a defined kind of I want to be this or that it's, in in relation to my my exactly career. Anyway, you know, you know, yeah, I I always kind of was envious of people who 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 from the get-go said, I want to be an accountant or I want to be this. I'm fair play to him, but I, I never really knew until I suppose I got into my work and life uh, what I enjoyed most, you know. So I, and I, I would have been fairly good at school um, to primary and secondary, probably underachieved when it came to leaving cert, um, you know, but, but I suppose once I got into the college, it suited me and uh, that way of learning suited me. And um, I suppose I, I was lucky then in my career, my early days, I, I had a couple of good mentors and I got into a couple of good roles and that really kind of kick-started my career, you know. And Niall, of course, uh, UL isn't far away from you anyway, in the sense that, what did you study in UL? What did you orientate towards? What took your interest? Yeah, I, I thought, I probably went to, went to, I studied production management, but I, it was more I wanted to go to UL rather than I had a, sort, uh, a necessary draw for production management, right? So look, uh, hindsight's a great thing, but but production management is a bit of it's a mix between business studies and uh, manufacturing, effectively. And and at the time, obviously, going back to I started UL in the year two thousand, so going back to the year two thousand, clearly manufacturing in the Limerick region was 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 quite large. You had Dell and you, you'd Wang and you'd uh, look, plenty of really yeah, your choices, yeah, yeah, yeah. So at that time, obviously, now. Um, Believe it or not, that, that course no longer exists in UL because clearly what happened in the mid 2000s was there was a collapse, you know, around 2009 when Dell left and all that stuff. Yeah. But, uh, and, and I, I discovered halfway through the course probably that um, whilst I enjoyed aspects of it, you know, I didn't feel that it was something that I could see a career in myself. Um, so once I, I graduated, I, I always had a, an interest in marketing and I always had an interest in food. So lo and behold, there was a, a master's in UCC food marketing and I, and I went down to Cork uh, to do a one-year master's in that and that was something I really enjoyed. In food marketing. And then, of course, you, you, you finished, of course, when you finished up, then you were obviously looking for employment. And where did you end up? How did you... Uh, did you get... A, uh, I think my memory now is looking up about you. Did you wind up with the idea? 
Oh, I, I did. That was that was well down the tracks. I mean, I, I'd probably be, be known in business circles in Limerick from my IDA time, but but actually, um, a lot of the the achievements that I'm I'm even more proud of came prior to that. When I lived, so I, I lived in Dublin for for ten years. Um, so when I graduated from Cork, uh, a friend of mine was working in Robert Roberts in Tala. Uh-huh. Um, and obviously, I just got the master's in food marketing, so this was something I wanted to get into. So. Through, through horror, I actually ended up getting an interview with Rob Roberts and, and I was successful. Got in there and I spent two years with them uh, and it was the best training in my life. Um, I had a great boss. She was, she was tough but fair. I uh, learned an awful lot from her um, and I worked hard. I think, you know, particularly my early, like, I, I worked very hard in my early days to try and build myself up. And, and I, 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 I suppose I began to understand what I was good at. Uh, and part of that was my work, my, my work ethic. You know, I'd be first in and last out. Uh, and that, that, you know, not, not to say that my colleagues weren't working hard either, but no. my work ethic probably stood out in my early days, uh, my, my drive and, and probably overly committed to the job at times. But that was a great learning curve in Rob Roberts. You know, you're, you're working off very tight margins, one, two percent, under five percent margins, uh, distributing different products uh, through, through a van sales team around the country. Uh, obviously well known for their coffee but they, they have plenty of other brands in their stable absolutely yeah and, um, and you mentioned there and I look at it that it's very important that you have someone as you alluded there to your boss you know it's important that I, I, I've spoken to many people and, and that sticks to my mind it's not the educational thing it's, it's on the job when somebody takes you in hand I don't mean that in a negative way but yeah and as you said there your boss was fantastic Oh, I, I 100% agree with you, Pat. Like, you know, I really found myself in the work environment. And let's be honest. And look, I, I, was, I wasn't, you know, I was decent enough at education. I was good enough at school. I was good in college. But, but I really excel when I get into the work environment. And I think, you know, I, you'd often hear it heard as well. Like, your, more, your, your personnel skills, your rounded skills become more to the fore when you get into the work environment. It's not all about the technical capability you learned. It's yes. about your ability to deal with people. And you'll see in life, a lot of the people that excel have an ability to connect with people and build relationships, as well as the technical skill set for whatever role they're in. Uh, and I suppose that stood out that, you know, in hindsight, that probably worked well for me, that I, that I could get on with people, and I could relate to people and, and uh, was able to listen and find ways to solve problems by actually being uh, pacifying people, I suppose, at times and, and trying to work around issues, you know, but but yeah, I, I would agree with you. I, I definitely believe if I was giving anyone advice, got into the work environment, get having a mentor and look, mentors now is a buzzword, right? But but I suppose I didn't know I had a mentor, but she was a mentor to me. And I've had I've had two or three bosses over the years. Uh ironically, actually, three three female bosses um who were very good to me and who I learned an awful lot about uh and helped me along the way. Um throughout my career and it's something that I would always I would always you know I think it's a very important aspect of of your development is having someone that someone said to me once that um the best thing you can do is 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 take take one good thing from every boss you had and put it bring it into your toolkit and take one bad thing they had and remove it from your toolkit and if you can do that you'll be a fairly rounded employee for somebody if you if you apply that to your to your work life and it's a great bit of advice you know in the sense of trying to take you know and, and like everybody is different and everyone has their own style but if you can take one good thing from every boss you had and apply it yourself and try and try and use it you'll be you'll do all right that's true and of course now the now when you'll be interviewing someone you're dead right there about everybody the, the 10 people on the interview list to be interviewed by you could have the exact same qualifications that won't get them the job as you said it's the more the other essential the other 90 percent really yeah your yeah absolutely are 10 percent. the rest of it is how you interact and your social skills and all of that and people forget that i think sometimes even today they still forget that you know yeah oh absolutely and look when when i left uh, rob roberts it felt like a long time at the time. It was only two years, but it, but it, it felt like a lot because I, I did a lot there and I, I learned right. a lot there. Right. Um, I, 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 I suppose I took the step up and joined Unilever, which are a large multinational company. Yeah, that, um, Unilever are big, yes. But that was, that was obviously, uh, when, they, when they knocked on my door, I couldn't refuse it because of the, the scale that they had. Um, 
and I spent eight years with Unilever. Um, incredible period of my career where I learned, you know, again, where I learned all my, my business acumen, I suppose, you know, and, and I said, I'll talk about idea in a minute, but when I got to the idea, like all the things I did in the idea were, were stuff I learned in Unilever and Robert Roberts, you know, so people, people don't know that about me, but, um, yeah. but, yeah. but basically, you know, I, I, the irony, I suppose, is having a marketing degree. I've never worked in marketing. I actually, you know, in Rob Roberts and in Unilever, I was working in sales and business operations. So yes, yes. Um, I've been lucky in the sense of I, I had a, you know, I had a manufacturing degree. I had a marketing master's and I spent a lot of my life in sales and business operations. So I was fairly well rounded in the sense of uh, a good understanding of business in general by the time I left uh, Unilever. Now, when I was at Unilever, you know, I had I had opportunities to go to, to Rotterdam uh, or the UK to, to European headquarters with Unilever. And uh, we just decided, you know, I decided it wasn't for me. I'm more of a home board. I could have followed that kind of global career path and I didn't. I, I, I don't regret it. Um, I'm, I'm really happy with where I've, where I've landed. But, um, but it's a company that had great opportunities. If you wanted to travel, you could travel the world with Unilever. It's a fantastic company, you know? Yeah. And has has a very good reputation in the business world. Anyway, I don't have to tell you that. My special guest this morning is uh, Niall O'Callaghan on Lear Confidential, CEO of LEDP. We'll come to that later. I know I said it before, we'll come to that later. Now, you're in the IDA then next. Uh, how did you land in there? <laughs> uh, a bit fortuitous, I suppose. I, uh, myself and my, my, my then wife, we, we, we weren't long married. We, want, we were both based in Dublin and we wanted to move back to Limerick. Okay. Um, and I suppose I'd been looking for a while about, you know, uh, uh, probably unrealistically looking for a similar role to what I was doing in Unilever. Um, but clearly there isn't that type of industry in Limerick. Um, so by, by chance, I suppose, the first role that I, that I came across that was advertised uh, that I felt was similar to what I was doing was with the IDA. Um, now, obviously, very different, different world, you know, managing foreign direct investment companies. Obviously, I was working in a large company and, you know, by the age of 32, I was managing a portfolio of about 60 million euros. So that the one thing about the good thing about Unilever is, you know, when people are young, they'll give you responsibility, and if you're successful, they'll continue to give you responsibility. But they'll give you a chance. Yeah. Absolutely. So I, I was aware of, you know, and I had the experience of of managing big portfolios and big budgets. So uh, the idea role, I suppose, uh, took a bit of a chance. I, I obviously applied for it, and thankfully they, they they saw something in me. I suppose again. I felt that I could bring to the table my personnel skills in, in building relationships with, with companies either existing or looking to potentially come to Limerick. And right. then secondly, my business acumen, understanding business and understanding the complexities and the operational side of it, I felt I could bring that to bear. Um, and I've always been a big believer in transferable skills. And, and luckily, I was successful in the interview. Um, so I came to Limerick and I became the, the, the regional manager um, for the IDA. And that's really, I suppose, from a Limerick perspective, where people began to know me, um, you know, in, in respect of getting out and about. But, I mean, I, I set myself a very uh, personal target when I joined the IDA. I was very aware that, you know, nobody would know who I am. Um, I didn't come from the Limerick scene. So I wow. set myself a target of within the first six months of, of going out and meeting 80% of, of the current IDA clients. Okay. You know, so, um, and that was something I achieved um you know literally going out and, and meeting meeting the clients and understanding their business even if it's just for 10 or 15 minutes of coffee you know sometimes it was an hour sometimes it was 10 minutes but yeah. understanding what the, what they do what their business was what the challenges were how i could possibly help and that began to i suppose get people to know me in the region people began to know me quite quickly because of that um and yeah uh, that, that look ida again another fantastic organization um really well you were regional manager of, of the southern area, was it? Uh, the Midwest, so Limerick, Limerick Clare and, and North Tip. I live out in Shannon, of course. I'd be well familiar. And I was on the road before I retired from the civil service. But anyway, you, how much autonomy had you then? Obviously, there's a board to report. I understand that, of course, you know. Yeah. Yeah, but no, it's a good, how, it's a good how, question. How long, say now, how long did it take you to build up... Uh, that they would trust you, like you'd say, look, I, I think this is, the, this is the company for here, whatever the case may be. How long did, did, did you feel that, 
God, I'm trusted now in this, in this, because sometimes these unwieldy board things can can put you back a step yeah. or two, you know? Yeah. No, it's a good question, Pat. I, I, I suppose I'll probably answer in a roundabout way. The first thing to say is uh, it's probably the most autonomous role in the IDA, actually, the, the regional managers. And even, you know, um, right. former co- a former colleague of mine, Mary Buckley, who, who's a great support to me, she's the uh, executive director of the IDA. She would always say to me, you're the chief executive of the IDA in the Midwest region. And that's the way you have to approach the role. And she was spot on. We actually had a lot of autonomy to regional managers because there was no definitive, here's your diary for the day. It right. was just things arisen, arose and you had to be proactive and you had to be able to connect with people and you had to be able to find solutions by through your network. So as regards building relationships, I suppose you're only as good as your last uh, resolution. You know, as you can only... You can build relationships by meeting people, but I suppose delivering is the key thing. And, and if, if they've got an issue and, and you can be proactive in dealing with that issue, you'll build rapport and, and uh, reputation very quickly. And again, that was something I was very conscious of. I, I, you know, I would, nice. I would try and solve things as soon as possible. Now, that's obviously for the existing companies. Um, and that's the bread and butter. That, that was the first port of call is making sure the existing companies had confidence in you. Exactly. The second piece then, I suppose, is, is potential new companies coming into the region. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that's a very different um, perspective altogether. You're working very closely with potentially somebody from the IDA based in, in California, and you're probably working with somebody based in Dublin who is, who is sectoral specific. Uh, so yes. the regional managers aren't, aren't sector or domain experts, but we are, I suppose, the, we're the connection with the, with, the, with the local infrastructure. On the ground, yeah. Yeah, so, so basically, I suppose, again, similarly, um, you know, it's how you interact with people. I always tell the story. I mean, th- th- sometimes it, it's, it's simple to me, but, you know, if I was collecting a client in Shannon Airport um, and they were with us for, they could be 24 hours, 48 hours, 72 hours max, and they could be, they could be going from Limerick, they could, then they could be going to Waterford, they yeah. could be going to Birmingham or Dundee or Amsterdam afterwards. Yes. So they'll do, generally, they'll do five seven-day business trip to Europe to look for an EMEA uh, centre. Um, I used to do very simple things. You know, I'd be given the name in advance of who they are, etc. I'd go and I'd search LinkedIn or I'd search Google and I'd, I'd, I'd try and see if there's anything online about them other than their technical yes. profession. I know, I know. So you might, you might find out through Twitter that somebody is a Patriots fan or, or they follow the Boston Celtics. Exactly. And, as soon as they sit into my car, I'd have looked up the results from the weekend, you know, and I wouldn't make it very obvious, but of course, but, but I might say, are you, are you into basketball? I see there Boston Celtics were playing the weekend and straight away like that, you've yeah. got a connection and, and they'd start talking to you and, they, and, and you, you've, okay, you might call it superficial, but you're trying to connect no, no, with them no, on no. something. It's very important to get a connection. It doesn't matter. I don't think there's anything superficial because those people, as you said, now, they're used to going out around the world, you know? Yeah. And as you said, it's a small connection, but it's, you're in there, you're in their head. They're relaxed, you know? Now, Absolutely. Can I just say, I mean, the idea itself does get a lot of negative press and mainly from politicians. I understand that, you understand that. Why didn't I get this factory? Why should it be there and all that? Now, I think myself, my own personal opinion, I know what you think, my own personal opinion down through the years, and uh, I think there's way, way too much political interference with business. That's my opinion. I know they must advocate politicians that are elected to represent, say, Limerick or Cork or Kerry. They must advocate for business, obviously, to come into the area, you know. But obviously, the, the idea is remit nationally is... I don't know, we heard of all this buzzwords, balanced regional development. I don't think it's ever happened yet, but anyway, I suppose uh, that's my own opinion for what it's worth. When you hear all of these politicians, and of course you get to meet them all yourself, yeah, and they're all looking for the for the factory in Killarney or down in Bandon or down in Newcastle West or wherever. How do you, <laughs> how do you deal with that? kind of thing of course you understand it you know it's a human thing yeah absolutely and, and actually on the human thing i've had occasions where tds 
our councillors have come out publicly criticising the idea and they'd ring me up afterwards and go, listen, I'm sorry about that. You know, I actually know you're doing a good job, but I had to say that. And look... <laughs> I'll need names and addresses after. <laughs> <laughs> like, like, now look, it's actually, I, I admire them for doing that, for, for having the, the gusto to actually pick up the phone and say, look, I, you know, I, I wasn't having to go. I actually think you're doing a good yeah, job. I, I have, have to... What to do, you have a job to do. I understand that. Exactly, exactly. And like, I, 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 I would work far easier with someone like that than, than someone who actually genuinely believes that there should be a factory in every village in the country. You know, because yeah, yeah, that's just, yeah. that's fallacy. Um, I suppose, look, education is, is very important. You know, uh, I've, I, I, I once said to, I won't say which county, but I sat in front of a, uh, a council committee and, you know, everybody, everybody likes, to, likes to talk about FDI and multinationals and, oh, sure, like, shouldn't we be getting loads more now because of Brexit and, and because Brexit's coming, this will go back a couple of years ago, obviously. Yeah. And, and, like, it's way cheaper here than it is in Dublin. And it's 50% cheaper and blah, blah, blah. And I actually turned around one day and I wasn't having to go, but I said, lads, look, you know, let's be real here. There's 25 other counties saying the exact same thing, that they're cheaper than Dublin and cheaper than London. Yeah, like, yeah. There, yeah. There's nothing very specifically unique about this county versus all the other counties in Ireland when it comes to cost. Yeah. So part the cost element, right? Secondly, what you need to understand is not every FDI company is looking for a location based on cost. A lot of them, their investors or their shareholders want to be in a capital city or want to be in a city of scale or like cost isn't necessarily the overriding factor for these no, companies. No, um, So, so they'd look, looking at, uh, they'd be looking at, uh, is there a, a pool, is there a human resource around me that I can draw on to, to, uh, I suppose, to fit into the company, to fit yeah. into the building, you know? Yeah. And, and I'll tell you a good one, Pat, you know, and, and, you won't hear this kind of being said necessarily a lot, but it's a fact. When I was in the idea, we won investments and we lost investments because of uh, very idiosyncrasial stuff, right? So I'll give you an example. Uh, an executive comes over for the weekend to look at Limerick or look at Galway or look at Dublin or look at Belfast. Yeah. And they bring their wife with them because obviously their family is going to come with them if, they, if they've got to start up the European headquarters. Relocate, yeah. And I, and I say wife, I'm just using that as an example. It could be a partner yeah. or it could be vice versa. It could be a husband of, of, I, a, of an executive, right? I understand. Yeah. Um, and the partner will decide where the company goes, not the executive, because the partner will say, Jesus, you know, I far before walking down Grafton Street than I do O'Connell Street, or I like to look at that school, or yeah, this, this looks like a lovely location. This reminds me of home, yeah. right? Now, you can, win, you can win investments on that and you can lose them on that. And I can tell you straight out that a lot of the occasions when we won our last investments, it was very innocuous things like that, rather than the big ticket items of how cheap is it, you yes. know, what's the skills, skill set like in the region, et cetera, et cetera. It can come down to very small things. So it, and that, again, that's why your ability to know your region and your ability to influence people when they're here on the ground and connect with them is important because if you're... If you're trying to sell O'Connell Street over, over Grafton Street, you're going to have your, it's going to be stacked up against you. So you have to find other angles to kind of convince them it's the right place to be. So you have to be uh, aware of their personal needs as well. I mean, as you said, the, the, the couple, the family that's, that's going to relocate, you have to be aware of the ages of their children and, of course, where they're going to be living. I understand all of that, you know, but um, what's the environment like now today? Well, of course, you can't talk about the idea today, but anyway, we better get along, Niall, before, uh, mm. before we, we lose time. You're now CEO of the Limerick Enterprise Development Partnership, LEDP. And for those of you who doesn't know anything about it, where it is, it's located in the old Krupps factory in Limerick City, for people who may not know. Now, what about, uh, what do you do there? What, what does that do for people? Yeah, it's a good question, Pat. If I, if I got a euro for every person who asked me that over the last four months, I'd be a very wealthy man. Um, we're a charity, first and foremost. Um, and we're, yeah, oh. believe it or not. So th there's a lot of, um, I won't say misunderstanding, a lack of understanding of LEDP um, and what we do. We're a charity by name, believe it or not. Now, we're very unique because we're one of the very few charities in Ireland that don't fundraise. Uh, and we're self-funded by the property that we own here in Roxburgh. Um, okay, 
Now, sorry for, that's interesting to me because I'm going to ask you what kind of a budget have you every year starting off? Because I understood being an enterprise that you would have to be given a black budget. Here are lads, do this, this, and this, and off you go. But that's interesting now. LEDP, they own the Marcus Field. Correct. So we, oh. we've, tri we have three, three core assets. We have the Marcus Field Stadium. We have uh, the LEDP building, the old cup site. Yeah. And we also, we also have a creche, which is, a, which is just uh, attached to the, that, that site as well. All oh, right, yeah I, yeah, I remember what, driving around it a few times, yeah. Now, for a company, do you encourage or do you ask or do you invite? For a company like ourselves, we have a small company. We only, God, we started up last year. Can you imagine then we were in lockdown two months later? But I'm not going to give you a McCone, McCone. I'll give you that later on the phone. <laughs> but <laughs> I'm just saying, like, you, the units up there in um, the old cops building, what are they used for primarily? Yeah, so we, we, we've, uh, it's multidisciplinary. So we have some um, commercial tenants whose, whose sole purpose is commercial, such as Virgin Media. We have oh, yeah, uh, some. You're outside, yeah, you're right, yeah. yeah we've, we've some charitable organizations such as Blue Box, such as the Irish Wheelchair Association, um, such as Pubble, such as the Brothers of Charity. Um, we have some educational partners, uh, believe it or not, UL have a presence here with the UL Access Campus and oh, nice. am amazing work with um, homework clubs and supplementary education for, for uh, kids in the locality. Uh, and then we have a large amount of training and enterprise facilitation, which happens. Um, so the Education Training Board have quite a lot of space here. Currently, they're doing hospitality training with chefs um, and bar staff in one area. And they're doing trades, wet trades in another area. So we have a very mixed uh, tenant base on site here, which, which, is, which is exactly what we want in the sense of commercial education, um, training, enterprise, community initiatives. So I suppppose it, it's really um, a, a, mixed, a mixed bag of, of different types of tenants that we have on site here. Right, and of course, before I, I forget it, I know that it's not open now, but they have a beautiful cafe up there. I had, often had a fabulous breakfast there and lunch up in LEDP, the old cup factory lads. When, when it's get up and running, get up there and you'll be well fed for a reasonable rate. Anyway, that's Absolutely. <laughs> I forgot to mention that. And so you're totally self-funded. Totally self-funded, yeah. Now, we have in the past received uh, contributions from the likes of the McManus Foundation, I must say, must say that. But, but as regards a day-to-day -day operation, effectively the rent that we receive from our tenants um, pays for our existence and pays for the benevolent activity that we get involved in. Right. And now Niall, um, Niall O'Callaghan is my special guest CEO of LEDP on their confidential here with us this morning. Delighted to have you, Niall. Now, um, the Marcus Field is, I suppose, any soccer lovers, I love soccer myself. I like supporting local junior soccer and all of that. And I think my son is going playing again when, whenever the thing, but so it has brought me into it. But um, I love to see in a city the size of Limerick say, I'm not taking sides on anything. I'm just saying that I hope Treaty United get a license to participate in the first division. Because it would be great to have League of Ireland soccer back in that facility. I've no doubt I have to tell you that anyway, Niall. And Absolutely. Our fingers crossed for Treaty United to just, just to get the ball rolling, you know? Absolutely. I mean, look, we, we would love nothing more than that. Um, you know, we want, we want League of Ireland soccer back in the market's field. Um, it's, 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 the, it's the home of Limerick soccer in Limerick. Um, and... Yeah, we do hope certainly that, you know, we've had very positive conversations with Treaty United over the last number of months. Uh, they've worked very closely with us and we've worked closely with them. Um, and we'd really love to see that their, their project come to fruition. And they seem to have put the, the real foundation uh, blocks in place. They've got Tommy Barrett now as a manager. Um, yeah, 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 I saw that recently. Yeah. They've well, an excellent... I, he knows his way around, well qualified. Absolutely. And they've, and they've an excellent women's club as well. Um, who have been playing the market field. So um, they, they look at, yeah, very, very hopeful that they're successful, please God. And uh, hopefully we'll see the return of senior soccer to the market field this year. And what we're saying to people here on their media, and I'm sure you like it the same, 
goodwill is, will only take you so long. We want people to put their hands in their pockets as well and support Treaty United. You know, that, no, that's a very, very good point. And look, Con Murray is steering the ship there, and and they, they really are. Uh, he's really progressive and really looking to to drive Treaty United on. So yeah, abs- they're going to need all the support they can get. So we'll be and, right there beside him. Absolutely, Lyle. And have you got um, up there now? And have you got full house there now? Have you units available or what? We, we, we have one specific unit available, um, which is the, the core of the building, the innovation hub, 30,000 square feet. Um, now, it's been vacant. It, it, it's never had an occupant, per se. Um, the rest of the building, thankfully, is, is occupied. Um, but uh, we are working on a number of potential projects that could fulfill that building, but we're certainly open to conversations at the moment. We've had, we've had good interest in the building, given its, its geographical location. Right. Um, straight off the motorway. Any building that has parking and and has a cafe and all, but thirty thousand square feet will be a big, I suppose, a big um, undertaking for in this in, in this environment. And there's no doubt about that. It'd be a big challenge, really. Now, you know, 30, yeah, it is. It is. I look, we, we're we're very very. I'm looking no no more no better man than myself to understand uh, how difficult to fill a building like that is. But but we're having very positive uh, conversations around a specific sector that, that I'm hopeful will come to fruition. It may not fill the whole of the building, but it's, it's to fill a, fill a gap in the market that currently exists. And it's going to be a, gro- a, a really accelerated growth sector for Limerick in the next couple of years. So we're hopeful that we can play our part by using the Innovation Hub to facilitate some of that activity. But hopefully, hopefully you'll hear more, more on that later in the year, Pat. Well, you're welcome to come on any time because we have a we have a we just began a business show, an actual business show. It has an international dimension. I know it's uh, our the partners with us are the British and Irish Trading Alliance, fortuitously speaking, because of the situation now with Britain uh, not being in the EU anymore. It's an extra challenge, but they've come on board to do to do our business show. And John Fitzgerald is a good guy, and uh, we hope people like yourself. If you have any news anytime or anything you want to share and get publicity, with, we're there and uh, we'll do our little part as well, Niall. Perfect. So Lovely now, part. There's no doubt about it. You came into the job in... Um, <laughs> I don't even want to say it. You came into the job <laughs> probably one of the most challenging times. I mean, I don't know what you were thinking yourself. Or <laughs> I don't mean that in a negative way, but... I mean, since you came in the last time, I mean, the country has been in lockdown and slight over it in lockdown, which I have my own view on. I won't say it now because I get totally mad. But how has it been like for you in the last seven seven months you're in the job, you know? Yeah, I, look, uh, I suppose obviously I was, I was acutely aware of what I was taking on. And that's the good thing that, you know, we were in the midst of the pandemic when I took on the role. So it wasn't a complete shock. So I, I, like, I went in with my eyes open. Um, is the first thing I would say. It certainly has been challenging because, you know, it's difficult. You can't physically go out and meet people. You, you know, I can't meet my tenants. I, I can't meet stakeholders that I would have worked with in the IDA, etc. Um, have a cup of coffee with them. Exactly. And that's important in my game, you know. Um, but look, we, we, we've managed around that fairly well. I suppose I always look at, try to look at the upside, right? So the positive of the last couple of months was that it allowed me to do what I was hoping to do, uh, which I didn't think I would be able to do this quickly, which is set out uh, a work stream around creating a new vision, a new mission, uh, and a set of values for us as, as, a, as a company. Um, and I've been working closely with our board over the last number of months. And thankfully, we're, we're nearly at the end of that process now. So we'll have, we will have a, a new vision and a new mission for the LEDP so that we can answer questions like you asked at the outset very, very uh, succinctly about who we are and what we do. Yeah. And the, the second part of that project that I, I, I wanted to undertake in my first year here was, was to write a new strategy for us uh, and, and, yeah. and look for the board to, ad- to adopt that strategy. And hopefully that will be done by uh, the middle of March, uh, April at the latest. So I suppose at that point in time, I'll be six months in the role and, you know, look at the positive of not being able to maybe fulfill some of the things I would have liked to have done pre-COVID, at least yeah. we'll have a new vision, a new mission, and a new strategy. And we can actually start then uh, working on how we're going to achieve the strategy, and we can start amplifying to all our stakeholders about who we are, who the new LEDP is, what we're trying to achieve, um, and, and make that a bit more clearer for all our stakeholders. And uh, the LED is the board, a voluntary board, Niall, is it? 
It is indeed, yeah. Is George still around there, George Lee? George, yeah, works, working very close with me. Uh, he's a very passionate man. Um, <laughs> yeah. I tell you, if, if you want a history lesson on Limerick, George is the man to go to. Oh, absolutely. Uh, absolutely. We were up there a couple of years ago with him now when we were looking for space, you know, ourselves to, to begin. So we walked the highways and byways at the base. Anyway, we're down here on Mallow Street. That's where we're based. But say hello to him anyway first. And, uh, I will, of course. But Niall, um, so now the challenges with COVID, the challenges, as you said, for business, the challenges to fill up the 30,000 uh, space in the innovation hall. You have it. And three small kids as well. And of course, your wife. I oh, know that will not forget. No. Uh, <laughs> fair play to you. That's all I say to you now. <laughs> and the kids, of course, now, uh, the school's closed as well, has posed personal uh, extra problems for you as a family, you know? It has, yeah. Like my, my wife's a teacher, so we're probably, I would say, one of the luckier couples, to be honest with you. Uh, and she won't thank me for saying that now, but but because she's a teacher, oh, no, herself, mean, yeah. um, she doesn't physically have to be anywhere. She's doing the homeschooling for her own classes, obviously, uh, and then she can she can help out at home looking after the lads. Um, and look, I try and work from home myself, but but I need to be here quite a bit. So look, it's not easy for any family at the moment, to be honest with you. But but I think. I think what you've seen is a maturity from a lot of companies in, in accepting that. Uh, and that people have no choice but to accept it. And Sorry. I've been on lots of Zooms over the last few months and there's kids in the background and it doesn't bother me. You know, I, th- I still think people can fulfill their duties and their roles. Um, it's part of life and I think we need to get used to it and it's the way forward. Absolutely, Niall. And uh, I'm, I'm absolutely delighted, Niall, before, to wish you... All the very best in these challenging times, and uh, I would do, we're delighted to speak to you. And as I said to you before, anything you want to just drop us an email if you want to publicise or highlight anything. We're there to serve the people of Limerick. We like to think anyway. And uh, from Nilo Callahan, um, our special guest, CEO of LEDP, the Limerick Enterprise Development Partnership, from this edition of Lear Confidential Nile. I thank you very much for coming in and I wish you all the very best in the future. Thanks, Pat. Pleasure. Thank you, Niall, and talk to you again soon. Bye-bye. Thanks, Pat.